How are the beautiful people of Trinity doing? This is a home away from home, I tell you. I don't want to leave. Oh, it's great to see you in so many relationships and uh, so many beautiful people that I've come to know and uh, respect over the last years that we were here. But God's called us onward now to another challenge, and we covet your prayers in it as their ambassador now also. My goal is to challenge people to answer the call of God in their lives, and I'm going to try to do that this morning. But I just pray the Spirit of God would touch you. It's been a busy last year especially, um, visited over 30 churches and been going from place to place, far away and close by. Um, here, here's some churches, uh, just a, a few of them that where we were, went to, Saint Yes Saint. The altars have been full in every church, calling people to commit their lives to the call of God in Jonquière, up around the Lac Saint-Jean area, and then the next one over in uh, Hawkesbury, of course, Ontario, just the other side of Ontario. And then keep going, uh, Vaudreuil d'Orion, not far away from here, French church. Pastor Claude Jean is doing an excellent job there. Um, Quebec City, the Carrefour Chrétien, and uh, Pastor Frederick is doing great now after replacing Pastor Paul Corriveau, who, who retired. And uh, Gatineau, of course, uh, in uh, the Ottawa region. Uh, and I'm just here to say that Evangel, of course, uh, was there just a few months ago. And, and uh, God is doing an amazing work. God is on the move in this province. I tell you, it's an exciting time to be alive and to serve Jesus. I just encourage you to get on board. It's the time really not just to do things like normally. There's something rich about the call of God. And it's the treasure that we should value more than anything else we do. So thank you for your support. I couldn't do what I'm doing and the support of IBQ unless you supported uh, the ministry I'm doing. So thank you, Pastor Paul, for your vision in this area and the church board and each one of you for supporting IBQ over the years. We are partners together. And anything that happens is a team effort and we give glory to God because it's never just one person. It's all to his glory. This morning I want to talk to you about the hope of his calling. And my prayer for you is the following from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is like an anchor. The storms will come. You can't prevent them. What storm are you going through right now? The waves are there. Your boat is tossing, but there is peace on that boat. There's hope on that boat. There's a future on that boat. There's an anchor to that boat. You're not going to capsize. You're not going to drown. You're going to make it through by the grace of God. And not only are you going to make it through, you're going to flourish in God's plan for your life. Boy, life throws us curves, doesn't it? I mean, this summer we moved to Vaudreuil area and... Um, Figuring it unpack, enjoy the summer, go for walks along the water there. We're not too far away. And my wife breaks her foot. And it's, you know, the, the left foot's a little bone, the left part of the foot. It takes a long time to heal. And here I am, I got to take care of her. July 21st, she's on crutches in a wheelchair. I'm pushing her around. That's not the summer I wanted, you know. And I was carrying her up and down the stairs. Oh, for about four or five days until my back gave out on me. It's like, you know, I can't do this anymore. So I, you know, I got her some crutches, and she hobbled around on the crutches a bit, but she hated those crutches. She says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall down. So we got her a wheelchair, and I whirled her around on the wheelchair a little bit. And then I got her a knee scooter, and she was just kind of going all, I got to slow her down, you know, on this knee scooter, you know. She was having a lot of fun in the knee scooter. But her foot's swollen, and it's aching, and... And I learned new things. I, I learned actually how to do wash and, you know, the washer and the dryer. I, I'm now officially certified in that area. I really have a new, something I can add to my CV right now that I didn't have before. But, uh, yeah, uh, but she's getting better, thank God, taking over those responsibilities, which I, I do not particularly enjoy. But... Uh, Life throws you curves. Life is filled with ups and downs. And sometimes you ask, why, Lord, do I have to go through that? 
where are you in the midst of that? And he's always saying, I'm right there next to you. I'm crying with you. I'm laughing with you. I'm holding your hand. Don't think I'm far away. I'm touched with the feeling of your infirmities. And I'm going to see you through. Never think God is far. By his spirit, he wants to minister to you and give you hope for your tomorrow. I was reading just this past week in the Gazette, an article entitled Chronic Sorrow, which has discussed chronic pain and hopelessness of people who have lost the ability to grieve. Their grief is frozen. They're stuck with chronic sorrow. The official term is ambiguous loss, an unclear loss that has no clear resolution. Examples being family of children who have been kidnapped or Soldiers missing in action, not knowing if their loved ones are dead or alive. It it means they can't grieve. I mean, there's no resolution. There's no finality to what's taking place. You don't know where they are. I've lived that in my life with my daughter. Remember when she ran away from home? I didn't know if she was alive or dead. You know, like, there was no funeral. There was nothing. She's alive, I think, somewhere. Those situations have a way of marking you sometimes, and they can mark you for good or they can mark you in a bad way. Um, But living with hope, real godly hope, is very challenging. I mean, to confront life and all the dimensions of its complicated truth, to believe that life does not end in vain requires a particular attitude towards life that And the one that only God can give you a bright future and an assurance. Talked about a story of hope. One that I've been studying. I went back to school since I've left here and studying again. And my heart is just to know more about God. I just want to gain knowledge. I want to know him. And I hope you have that heart hunger to study. To go deeper in your knowledge of God. There's such riches involved there. And I will be a student to the very day I die. Jürgen Moltmann, born in 1926 in Hamburg, Germany. He grew up as an educated uh, person, secular home, reading uh, luminaries of literature and science. Hitler had cut short his education in 1943, when Moltmann's whole class was assigned to the anti-aircraft batteries in Hamburg. He was just 16 years old. In 1945... Jürgen Moltmann, his eyes searched the uh, German forest for a glimpse of his fellow soldiers' Nazi gray uniforms. Well, somehow he got separated from his unit. And, and then he made this decision because he didn't really believe in this war. And so he looked around and he spotted a, some soldier dressed in a brown army jacket and, and the unmistakable shape of the other soldier's helmet. He said, that's a British soldier. So he threw down his rifle and he put his hands above his head and he walked and surrendered to that soldier saying, I'm done with this war. He had been enduring uh, the bombing raids in Hamburg and uh, witnessing the horrific deaths of friends and Moltmann decided that he had enough. With memories of the terrifying battles uh, uh, fresh in his mind, he found that the literature which had meant so much to him as a boy all these, you know, the Renaissance literature and all these things and, you know, modernity coming along with all the industrial revolution. Everything seemed to be up and up. But now all of a sudden, you know, you go through two world wars and all the things happening in the world and, you know, you say, this life is not going to give me the utopia I'm looking for. So Moltmann said, being a POW can't be worse than war itself. But behind barbed wire, and he was in a concentration camp first in Belgium and then transferred over to England for about three years from 45 to 48. Um, He suffered horrific nightmares. He felt unrelenting guilt for what his country had done, collapsed into deep depression and hopelessness. At that point, many of the prisoners gave in to despair and lost any desire for their future. He became even more troubled when he and his fellow prisoners were confronted with the pictures of concentration and extermination camps at Belsen and Auschwitz. 
The initial disbelief among the German soldiers soon gave way to a grave realization that they had indirectly participated in these horrors. His experience as a prisoner of war had a powerful impact on his life, and it was at this camp he, he was reflecting upon the devastating nature of World War II, and, the, and he was filled with a great sense of remorse. He observed that his fellow prisoners who had hope fared the best, and he recounts, the depression on the wartime destruction and captivity without any apparent end was exacerbated by a feeling of profound shame at having to share in this disgrace. He was confronted, though, with an unexpected source of hope when an army chaplain gave him a Bible. He was confused at first by the great deal of things he read in the Bible, but he found himself transfixed as he came across the Psalms of Lament and read the passion narrative of Jesus going to the cross. As he read about the sufferings of Jesus on the cross, Moulton writes that he encountered a God who could identify with his own suffering. He says, I began to understand the assailed Christ because I felt that he understood me. This was the divine brother in distress who takes the prisoners with him on the way to resurrection. I began to summon up the courage to live again, seized by a great hope. Friends, we need to be seized by a great hope. This world creates hopelessness. There's a downward pull, not just by gravity, but by the immorality and by the hopelessness that exists all around us. Moltmann, in the end, was transformed as he embraced salvation in Christ, the glory of the cross, and the resurrection of hope. And it's like he went from death and the hopelessness and the shame and the disgrace of the war to becoming a new creature in Christ. Uh, he wrote in the end 43 books. Today he's regarded as one of the most significant theologians of the age and described as the mostly wide-read Christian theologian of the post-era, post-war era. In 64, he, he published his first book entitled The Theology of Hope. How appropriate. He writes, to live without hope is to cease to live. Hell is hopelessness. It's no accident that the entrance above to, to entries hell is the inscription, leave behind all hope. Who can enter here? And, and, and Moltmann would say, to, to believe means to cross in hope and anticipation the bounds that have been penetrated by the raising of the crucified. For him, hope was based on resurrection. Hope was based on new life. It wasn't just, I hope it'll all work out. There was a fact, there was a foundation, there was a certainty, there was an assurance related to the hope that he had and that we need to possess today. Hope does not mean the denial of suffering or injustice. Nor does it mean that as human beings we'll be able to heal creation apart from God's gracious empowerment. Uh, hope is based in what God has promised to do in the future. And as we believe the future promises of God, uh, we bring them back into the present. Uh, Moltmann would express it this way. Uh, Christian hope draws the promised future of God into the present day and prepares the present day for the future. You see, our God is always seeing what's ahead of us. He knows the beginning from the end, but he wants us to believe he's the God who has a plan in the future. But for that plan to become realistic in our lives or reality, we must draw it by faith into the present for it to become true. Moltmann concludes with these inspiring words, but the ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found at all in what we want and wish for and wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. What is it we are waited for? What awaits us? Does anything await us at all? Are we all alone? Whenever we base our hope on the divine mystery, we feel deep down in our hearts there is someone who is wanting waiting for you, who is hoping for you, who believes in you. You are waited for as a prodigal son. And the parable is waited for by this father. We are accepted and received. And as a mother takes her children into her arms and comforts them, God is our last hope because we are God's first love. Why don't we repeat that together, that last sentence. Say it out loud with me. Uh, God is our last hope because we are God's first love. 
Say it to somebody next to you. Do you know that you're God's first love? Have hope today. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the hope of his calling. There is nothing greater than the hope of his calling in our lives. And the verse I'd like to share with you is in Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. Let's read it. I ask that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. Let's start off at the beginning of this verse. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. There's a spiritual world around us. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. We are a spirit and we have a soul, our personality, and we live in a body. The most noble part of you is not your body, but it is your spirit and it is your soul made in the image of God. And in essence, we find here that to see the invisible spiritual realities that surround us, we need faith. The eyesight of the soul is your faith. Without faith, you can't please God. And the faith that God wants you to have is based on a trust relationship, based on his love and his mercy toward you. We read many verses which underline this truth, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen. Or again, we walk by faith and not by sight. Or Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This happens for us now, especially by the work of the Holy Spirit, as he he illuminates the word of God, and as you come with that word of God before him, and the spirit is there as you're in prayer, all of a sudden, the eyes of your heart, your faith eyes are opened And you can see because of that relationship, because the spirit is the link between you and God and your openness to his moving and dependence on him makes it all possible. So let me ask you the question, how well do you know God? How do you know a person anyhow? Do you know them by looking at their picture? Do you know them just because you listen to a video recording of them? It's not enough. The way you know a person is because you spend time with them. You ask them, what's your experience? What have you gone through? Tell me about yourself. You, 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 you ask very specific questions to them because you want to get to know them. And as they reveal themselves and open their heart up to you, you have an understanding of who they really are. And the same thing is true with God. We need for God to open the eyes of understanding through an experience and a relationship. Relationships are based on experiences with a person. I would dare say you have a good relationship with somebody you have connection with and that you regularly see. That's an experience that builds a relationship. Same thing with God. We must get into relationship with him through experiences with him. And the more time you spend in experiencing God by his spirit, the more you actually know him. So it says in the Bible... That you might be, your eyes of your heart might be illuminated. For what purpose? So that you may know three things. Number one, the hope, that you might know the hope of his calling. You see, Paul is talking to these Ephesians and he's saying in the verses that precede 3 to 14 about the wonderful, extravagant love of God, his grace that he's lavished upon us. He goes on to talk about uh, the, uh, the, the blessings of the grace of God, the, his election that he, he elected us to be his son before the foundation of the world. He already had a plan for those that would be, he would save through gr- the redemption of Christ's blood the, and, and uh, God's chose a group of people to become holy and blameless for him. You're wanted. God loves you. God says, I've got a plan for your life 
He calls us and wants to make us his own. We become the apple of his eye. We become so special to him. We are valued above every other part of this creation. He pays the debt for all our sins by his blood. And then he says, live out your life to the praise of my glory. This is the hope of our calling on earth. God has called us for a purpose. He hasn't given us a hope just so we could come together and do our religious duty by coming to church on a Sunday morning, singing a few songs, praying a few prayers, uh, listening to a a pastor preach. Uh, No, no. This is all about God's call for us to be totally transformed into his image. We need to see the magnificence of his hope, which is not some ritual and routine, and the hope that God has been promised is really the hope of knowing him, the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. There is something happening so deep in your life when you come to Christ. We have hope that God wants us to become more than we ever could imagine we could be on our own. And the more you actually come to Jesus is the more you become your true self before God. Peter would say it this way. His divine power has granted us to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us Precious and very the pr- pr- great promises, and through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through de- because of sinful desires. And then Paul goes on to say, yeah, this hope is all based on the fact that there's been a deposit into your life. The Holy Spirit has been sent as a deposit, as a pledge, a seal guaranteeing your full imperance, a- 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 inheritance, uh, it is, it, the, it is the first installment of the inheritance that is to come. The Holy Spirit takes some of our internal inheritance and he puts it into your heart now. And you live out that inheritance, a bit of heaven on earth, in this now time you are living. And the follow-up will come where there's another part of it. But what is that inheritance in essence? How do we understand it? Well, the hope of our calling should fill our lives, should draw us into God's future. It's not like worldly hope. It's not a vague wish for something good. I hope it doesn't rain next Saturday. Don't want to be rained out at the church picnic. I hope someday to get a better job. I hope to hear good news from a doctor later this week or one of the most discouraging statements hoping for the best and expecting the worst. What does Paul mean by hope? Is the sure and certain expectation of the complete fulfillment of the promise that God has made for all those he calls into a relationship by faith in Christ. A certainty upon which we can trust our entire life and eternity. We hope it's not wishful thinking It has a basis. It has an anchor. It has a foundation. If Jesus is our living hope, it's because he's forever alive. He's forever interceding for us. He's the one that brings us from point A to point B. And the work he's begun, he will not stop until he finishes what he's doing. You can be sure that God's purpose for your life is you're powerfully in the palm of his hands and he has a purpose for your life. And all you have to do is say, yes, Lord. In your weakness, you say, I can't do it. I'm no good. But God says, no, I will do it through you. All I ask is for you to be dependent and reach out to me. And I will do the rest in your life. And you will see that you will not be a failure. You'll be a success in your life. We just need to give him the time and give him our heart. God's desire for everyone to discover who they are, why they're here, and what they have to do with their lives. And let me say it this way to you. God is calling us to an abundant hope, a buoyant, unsinkable, cheerful, trusting, a supernatural hope. This hope of his calling means that we're willing to take risks in this life. We're willing if we get hurt. We don't care if people don't like us. We don't care if situations overwhelm us because we can take risks because we know in whom we have believed. 
We have this assurance, uh, this hope is based on the promises of God, the character of God, and he cannot lie, and what he has said will come to pass. Uh, the promises of God are yea and amen. He goes on to say in the second part of this verse, I ask the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope of his calling. And secondly, that you might know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. What does that mean? Well, the word inheritance comes from a Greek word, kleronomias, and refers not necessarily to money or material possessions, but primarily to our place or assignment within God's kingdom. To the specific work or ministry to which you are to devote your energies and efforts. This inheritance is the outworking of God's purpose and plan for each of us. It's a different way of looking at it because sometimes we think of inheritance as being something we will inherit as if God will say, well, here's your inheritance. Your inheritance will be, I got you got a mansion, you know, just over the hilltop. Or maybe you've got, uh, I don't know, he'll give you some crowns. Or what, what's, what's inheritance? But the literal meaning of this word has nothing to do with material gain or objects. It has to do with an inheritance uh, that's related to the fulfillment of God's purpose in our lives and the joy and the blessing of God upon our lives when we strive to fulfill the purpose for which he saved us is our inheritance. Could it be that sometimes we're waiting for inheritance instead of experiencing it now in our lives? We're too busy just with our activities and everything around us thinking that our, re- our life with God is to come. And now we're just busy trying to make you know, by about our time until we eventually leave this world. We know where we're going, thank God, and we've got this assurance, you know, absent the body is present with the Lord. But it could it be that you're shortchanging yourself and that your inheritance is not being experienced now because you do not see the value of it. It says here that you might know the riches of his glorious inheritance. This word is a word, plutos, which basically means the treasure. You see, You will go after what you treasure. If you treasure this inheritance and you understand the inheritance is related to the call of God on your life, the hope of his calling and the fact that he's transforming you from glory to glory, glory by his spirit in your life, and you go after that as your priority, as your treasure, that's where it becomes riches for you. But if you ignore that, then you will never Receive the riches of your inheritance. Does that make sense to you this morning? Are you with me this morning? Okay, good. Just want to make sure you're still there. God's desire is for us to know who we are and where we are, why we're here, and what to do with our lives. This is the true riches of our inheritance. The more you tap in to the will and plan of God for your life, the more hope, the more joy, the more love will fill your heart, the less you'll be dependent on the the, the situations and circumstances and financial problems and relational problems and all that for your happiness. Once you live in that level with God, you'll find that you are much more stable And much more filled with hope and happiness than you've ever had before. And then it goes on to say that you might know the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. Power. The power of God. And when you read the verses that follow that, they're talking about the resurrection of Christ. God has used his power to raise Jesus from the dead. It says that he placed them at the right hand of God and that he put all things under his feet. Can you imagine for a moment the amount of power it took to raise Jesus from the dead to accomplish this? Paul wants us to see and understand the level of power that's in our God. God contains more power than we can ever imagine. It's power toward us The power that raised Jesus from the grave is the power that raises us from our spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ. 
It's the power that makes us recognize that, that we are treasured so that we can treasure God in return. God is working such that all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Understand God's purpose and God's love are active in our lives. When we seek out that purpose, when we give ourselves to a purpose that's greater than just the normal life we're living, our infinite salvation journey is constantly being pulled down by the spiritual gravity around us, uh, the world, the flesh, the devil. And as true as believers, we must learn to live out our lives. Uh, but God says that no devil in hell, no power, no circumstance in this world can stop you from fulfilling God's call and purpose in your life. Uh, He's going to see you through, not just to get by, but you're going to flourish, my friend, because God's not just called you to eke out an existence. He wants you to have a life abundant and more abundantly. Can someone say amen to that? Our part is simply to understand that we might have the eyes of our heart enlightened, and that by faith, which are the eyes of the soul, we can see clearly that what we are to know and how that should impact our lives going forward. God's power is so great. His, the breath, uh, by his breath, he made the universe. By his power, he sustains every single moment of our existence. By his power, he keeps the sun burning constantly, putting out a single second the same amount of energy needed by our current civilization for 500,000 years. One second, half a million years worth of energy. We're told the sun is an average star, and there are actually trillions upon trillions of such stars, and God is keeping each one of them burning the power of God toward us who believe. It's creative. It's constructive. It gives life. There is no lack of power. There's no power failure with God. God raised us from the dead spiritually. He transformed our minds from being agnostic and being against God. And he's brought us to a place. He took away the heart of stone. He gave us a heart of flesh. He put a new nature in our heart where all, cre- all, all things are passed away. Every, we become new creations in Christ. Uh, he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think by the power of God that works in us. Uh, I tell you, God is powerful this morning. Nothing is too difficult for him. Uh, the possible, impossible can become possible with him. The power for us and its power in, our, in us is astounding. Again, he is the one that says, the work I've begun in you, I will make it perfect until the day of Christ. His power in, in us eventually be consummated one day when he transforms this, 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 in, this corruptible body and gives me an incorruptible body and I will go into his presence uh, to enjoy him forever. God wants us to know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious grace, a glorious inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power to us to believe so that we would be maximally hope-filled and joyful. Let me conclude with this idea of the future of hope. What's the future of hope? The failure of our modern postmodern society is to bring lasting hope. Hope creates, I mean, it, but it's failed. This experiment of, of modernity and modern living and industrial revolution has been, you know, think of the world wars. Think, think of the famine. Think of the rich and the poor nations, the inequality that exists all around us. Uh, there's no hope there. Most people have hope to sort of succeed here, to hope to succeed there. But there's no hope beyond the grave. And until you're ready to die, you're not ready to live. And so we must be those people that recognize that we have a great opportunity in front of us to proclaim the God of hope, the God of the gospel, the God of the resurrection, 
that can take death and bring life out of any situation you've gone through. The Apostle Paul claims hope as one of the three less essential and everlasting virtues. Now these things, three, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. There you got it. There's your mission. Faith, hope, and love. Don't complicate life. It's not that complicated. It's been said that John was the apostle of love. Paul was the apostle of grace. And Peter, the apostle of hope. Listen to his letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. It's not hope and hope. It's the living hope. Jesus, who has risen from the dead through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven for you, but also experienced with the giving of the Holy Spirit right now in your life, who through faith are shielded by God's power for the salvation that is ready to reveal the last time. You're not just going to get by. You're going to make it through with flying colors, my friend. You're not just going to sort of say, woof, the door closes behind you and say, I made it. You're going to actually, on your way to heaven, say, glory, hallelujah. I am ready to meet the king. Faithful to him now, enter into the joy of your Lord. The gospel confronts a world of relativity and subjectivity through the resurrection and offers an objective standard, a basis of hope filled with promise, offering renewal and reality of a present and future relationship. Reality can be defined as things I can experience now but last forever. Everything else is but subjective. It's just relative. It's just for a time. You don't just live for things that are going to disappear. You live for something that goes beyond this life. Here's my prayer for each of you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you say to me, Pastor Ron, how do I get my hope back? What's, I lost hope. I'm, dis, I'm in despair. If you know what happened to me, I got three little ideas I put down that's helped me to get through some really difficult, dark days in my life. Let me share it with you. Number one, when you're losing hope, first thing you can do is dig deep into God's word. Consider the Bible and those who trusted in him and the result of God's blessing on their lives despite their tribulation and trials. Uh, look at God's character. Look at God and let it buoy your faith, strengthen you, uh, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and God, by the spirit of God, communicates hope, because hope is not wishful thinking. Hope has foundation. It's based on the fact and the proof of the resurrection of Christ. The evidence is there for us that our faith actually has a basis for us to believe. Number two, Remind yourselves, you don't know everything. I like that one. I don't know everything. I know a lot, but sometimes my wife still teaches me things. Like how to do the washer and dryer there, you know? Like, I didn't know how to do that before. I'm learning. But God, his ways are not our ways sometimes. And he, remind yourself that God sees the future and the, he sees everything. His word is like a lamp to our feet. We don't say it was fire. It's not a spotlight. That we got to trust him because of what he's done. And we got to say, Lord, I know who you are. And for me to think contrary is out of character for you. Trust his character. He's proven it. He's revealed it. Do you see with the eyes of faith? And the third thing I've learned is don't question in the dark what you see clearly in the light. I like that one. Here's how I can explain it. At nighttime, before you go to bed, you know where all the furniture is in your room. You know how to get to the bathroom without turning the light on, right? I know, some of you have night lights. You cheat. But 
you know, you, you get up from night, you don't want to wake up anybody else. You know, if someone's sleeping next to you, you say, oh, I'm not going to turn my lights on. You just get up and your eyes are half closed. You can't even see where you're going. And you're sort of going like this and you're going over to the bathroom. And, but you know where you're going because in your mind you have a mental picture of what you saw when the light was on. Now the lights are off. But you don't doubt that somehow the, I don't know, the cabinets moved. The chair should be there. You don't start questioning, thinking, oh boy, everything's changed around here. What if I trip over this? You know where things are. You trust what you saw in the light. So you don't question now that you're in the dark. The same thing is true with God. Remember what you believed when you were in the light, when things were going smooth. God hasn't changed. And now that you're in the dark, don't say, where's God? What happened? Just say, Lord, I'm going to go cautiously. But I know, Lord, that you're the same God in the light as you are in the dark. That's helped me so many times. It really has. <laughs> Musicians come back. I have gone longer here. But let me share this with you. God is not undone because he's not done. Let me read to you this little qu quote that I found. I thought it was so good. God was not done when Noah was in the boat. Sarah was barren and Joseph was in prison. Moses was on the run from Pharaoh. The children of Israel pinned against the Red Sea. The walls of Jericho blocked possession of the promised land. Gideon was hiding from the Midianites. Samson was seduced by a woman and blinded. Ruth was dis uh, widowed. David was mocked as a boy facing a giant. And Job's children were all killed. And government officials persecuted Daniel. Jonah was in the belly of a fish. Paul couldn't get, his, uh, get rid of his thorn. And Jesus was put in the grave. Say it with me. But God was not done. He, hope is not undone because he is not done. Say it with me. Hope is not undone because he is not done. God was not done in my life when my mother died at 42 years old and I was 18. Six months later, he called me to him and I experienced the Jesus in my heart and it changed me forever. God was not done when my son was dying and the doctor said he has nine hours to live because of respiratory problems. And then eventually he survived. And we prayed over his incubator, and he's alive today, more alive than he's ever been. God was not done when my wife died at 34 years old of cancer. It wasn't the result that I wanted or that I prayed for. But God was not done, and in his wisdom and in his purpose, he took her to himself, and she experienced total victory in his presence. His plan is bigger than mine. But he wasn't done, and he gave me Pastor Anna afterwards, uh, which is great. I'm, you know, 30, I better not say how many years. 35 years. Yeah. Is that right, honey? Okay. Usually she corrects me if it needs to be. God was not done when my daughter ran away at 13. You might think, you're not qualified to be a pastor anymore. Hey, can't even take care of your own kids. But after the death of her mother, the anger filled her heart. And she went on to her own very difficult path. It took 25 years because God was not done. She came back to Jesus and she now is a social worker. And she's going to continue giving her testimony and teen, teen challenges that God is the one that changed her life forever. You see, God is not done. It might take time for God to turn things around. God was not done when my, my, our first child, Anna and my first child was born at 24 weeks, one pound, five ounces. They said, 50% chance and complications to follow. And when we go back to reunions that have these preemies gathered together, all of them have issues. She is in perfect health, 100%. And we say, God was not done in her life. You see, God is not done in our lives. Now that I'm retired, well, sort of retired, you say, well, God, God is not done. 
The best days are still ahead of us. Uh, we serve a God who is a God of hope. There is a future that's drawing us forward. Do you feel the tug of the future of God in your life? Do you feel the tug of the plan of God in your life? Uh, are you just going to stand by and say, well, I'll just sort of stay, stay in my spiritual rocking chair till Jesus comes back. Well, I'm not going to stay there, my friend. There is too much that God hasn't planned for my life. Uh, and I want to experience my inheritance on earth now, part of it at least, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can too. But you must answer the call of God. It's a hope, a calling. The calling of God is filled with hope. You should be filled with such hope amidst a world that is falling apart uh, because you have the answer. And the Bible says you should have an answer for the hope that's within you. But for that to take place, you must bright bur bur you must bur burn brightly. Your light must be like a shining star. You must say, Lord, my best days are ahead of me. And Lord, I choose to answer the call of God. Move forward in that purpose. It's the way you experience the riches of your experience in the here and now. Don't delay. Don't give up because God is on the move. Amen? Stand with me, please. Hallelujah. We're going to sing this song. I told Pastor Paul it was going to be short of the second message. But you don't have to clear out the parking lot before the next service. So, And I won't keep you except just one song and one prayer. And you can go home. But, but if you could just give me your attention for just a few more minutes because this is the crucial moment in this message. This is the moment I've been waiting for. Your head's been filled. But now I want to ask God to touch your heart. If you're lacking hope today, if your hope has been dashed, death of a loved one, a bad report, health-wise, maybe a child that's wayward, I don't know what you're going through, but you're saying, Lord, it's tough. I want you to get an infusion of hope this morning. I want you to come forward and to not just stay where you are, but make it as a way you're saying, Lord, I'm coming to you as my living hope. And say, Lord, through the power of your resurrection, bring me out of whatever death and situations that is trying to kill my faith in you and resuscitate, not just resuscitate, resurrect me, Lord. Give me new life with a living hope, oh God. You've got so many promises for me to experience in the future and they're all based on fact and they'll be my anchor for the future. I want you to come forward and to get out of the darkness that seems to be filling your life. Your mind is cloudy, but God is bringing you out this morning. Can you come right now as I'm speaking? You need hope in your life. Don't stay there anymore. I need hope in my life. There's been so many times I found it so dark. Keeping my hope is not easy sometimes, but that's why the Holy Spirit was sent to, to reignite within you a desire to live and to live in abundance. Would you come right now and say, Lord, fill me with hope. And secondly, I want others to come and pray with those who are here right now. But if you're here this morning, and you're saying, Lord, I will commit to the call of God, the call of hope. I will commit to the hope of his calling. I want you to lift your hands toward heaven and to say, Jesus, I commit myself, the call of my hope. Lord, thank you. You have opened my eyes. You've illuminated the eyes of my heart. And now I know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance, and the power of God on display in my life in saving me. Uh, now, Lord, I move forward with anticipation, uh, with a great excitement as to the future that God has for me. Uh, help me to live it out as a priority. Help me to treasure the very call of God in my life. Can you start praying and saying, Lord, I refuse to be indifferent. I will move forward in the power of God this morning. Can you start praying now as we sing this song? Make it your prayer.